I'm going to be talking for about 10 minutes about the racing space and how things have changed. So if you're not really interested in it, just stop watching or listening to this right now. But for those that are interested, let's talk about the racing space and kind of how it has evolved first. Uh, I think about a year to a year and a half ago, people started to first distinguish between a racing quad and an acro quad in that if uh, you're doing acrobatics, you probably probably want a very different setup than if you're racing. And so it's gotten to the point where it is today where the most recent multi-GP track, as many of you probably already know, it's uh, it's been out for a while and it's been set up like across the country at different chapters and people have practiced this track a lot and so, some of these pilots can do this track with their eyes closed like seriously they know the turns that well it's become like like race car driving they know the turns they know how to take them they've optimized how they fly and they're just doing their best to you know pilot it consistently but that's kind of where the skill stops and where the strategy begins so you do have different racing setups and you try kind of try and most people try and just build one racing setup and kind of use it for everything but a race like this has forced people to really experiment and test to see how they can better execute the track and what i mean by that is this this particular track is it requires uh it doesn't require absolute speed it doesn't require um absolute crazy agility it's kind of like you can pretty much fly anything around it i think it has more to do with your strategy on how to execute the track so people have been experimenting with various different props different motors different batteries different setups different weights to mainly just try and get the adequate lap times in order to hit the maximum number of laps possible on the track and that's where the game has reached. It's gotten to the point where people kind of aren't sharing their their ideal setups because it's their secret. They've experimented with it. They've done a lot of work to try and land on that setup. And I think that's super duper interesting because while skill has a lot to do with it still, the setup also has a lot more to do with it. And, and what I really want to discuss is the various tricks that people have been talking about how to fly more efficiently, fly quicker, more consistently around the track. And a couple of things that I've, I've discovered talking to a bunch of pilots the past uh, couple of months about this track and about racing in general. So in the most recent race at uh, our chapter here in, um, uh, I guess, Los, it's, it's our only track in Los Angeles or around California, around North, Southern California, um, one of the pilots, actually I must say that one of the pilot's dads, one of the race dads, which don't underestimate race dads. They do a lot of strategizing, and they have a huge part in this. So uh, any good kid usually has a, a good um, engineer behind them or, or any good pilot. It's, it's hard. So, okay, so one thing about kids. They clearly can learn how to fly these things way faster than anybody that's older, which I mean is above the age of 25. It's like these kids, they pick up and fly these things, and three months later they are top pilot in the country, which is shocking, which is astonishing. There's a lot to be said about that. There's a lot of reasons for that as well, which I, I'm sure you guys, it's pretty obvious, you guys can figure them out on your own. Um, but a lot of them have a race dad, which are should not be underestimated. They contribute a lot to this and at one at the recent chapter race that we had at the recent regional race uh one of the race stats set the controller to a max throttle of 80 percent which means that the the maximum throttle that the the pilot could reach is 80 percent and i'm going to show you how to do it on the tyrannus right now uh, no. you go to this menu and then you go to outputs and then it's just your endpoints so you can set your max endpoint to whatever you want you can set it to 50 percent if you want and so uh, the goal with this strategy was mainly to limit the maximum amps that are drawn because it, in, I have a theory that what actually kills the battery is not, is not, it's not really just maximum amps or sustained amps. I think it's more uh, to do with your burst. So uh, another theory that I'm kind of sort of thinking about and developing and slowly testing is that you can run high KV, no problem. And course it's going to be able to draw way more amps than your battery can supply but if you're smooth on the throttle and you're not super punchy and super crazy busting the battery up I, I think it's going to last and it's going to be just fine you will you definitely higher kv absolutely gives you a higher top speed and, and to me 
it feels like it has much better control and I've, and I've heard that from many other pilots as well. So I kind of extrapolated some theories on top of this 80% throttle thing and um, a lot has come from it. So by limiting your max throttle, I, I don't think you're actually limiting your speed very much, especially when it's only 10-15%. I don't think it's, it's going to actually be 10-15% less speed. I think it's just going to take longer to get up to the speed. It'll, it, the acceleration is just less when you punch it. That actually might be a good thing on tracks that you can't really just punch it and go through the track max throttle. It might be a good thing to limit your maximum acceleration potential. Because the motor is still a little bit higher KV, or whatever the KV is, usually it's a higher KV that you have to tone it back because it's so powerful, uh, you're still getting the control improvement, which is, again, this is a completely unknown theory that I have personally just thought of myself and heard it from other pilots as well. No idea if it's true, but you are maintaining the performance of having, the handling performance of having a higher KV motor, which in my theory, it just draws more amps to execute certain maneuvers, so it just feels like it has more torque, or it actually does have more torque and more power up to a certain point. There is point. There is a, there's a too much KV limit as well, but up to a certain point, it feels like the higher KV stuff just feels like it has better control. So those are the two things you're doing. You're limiting your max amps. You're limiting your uh, your max amp spikes, which I think is far more important for the battery. And you're slowing down your acceleration potential, which can in turn help you get through turns a little bit easier. Now, this is just one trick, and I, I don't know if that actually works, if it helped. But in this certain, ca in this particular case, it allowed the pilot to finish the race entirely with, you know, going all out without worry, and the battery actually held up last, and he, he's getting top times. So it's something to be said about that. In practice, it actually worked out great. So on top of this, there's another idea that I have talked to another pilot about, Muo FPV, uh, and he doesn't fly with yaw very much, and that's very interesting to me because I know that FPV Provo and uh, Provo FPV and a couple other pilots that I've watched their footage, they don't fly. They, when you watch the footage, it looks like they're flying a plane. It doesn't look like they're flying a quad. Now, me personally, I love yaw. Yaw is yaw is how I fly and my yaw my yaw stick is is actually much more sensitive than the right stick for a number of reasons not just because I like high yaw rate because my finger just has a problem moving all the way to the end when I <laughs> go up and down on the throttle range which is just my problem but so if you're flying a lot with yaw the idea is that okay so in order to execute maneuvers the flight controller needs to spin the motors up and down accordingly to execute a roll pitch yaw whatever and so if you are flying at your max limit or up near the real high end of the RPM range, then the flight controller doesn't have access to as much RPM overhead to execute certain maneuvers. So I have no idea how the flight code works, but I expect that if you're maxed out, you still have yaw, you still have pitch roll and yaw control, so it's just reducing the RPM of the other motors to execute those maneuvers. I, I, no idea if that's true, but that's my best guess because when I'm at max throttle, I still have full control of the quad. So, the yaw move, move yaw maneuver in particular requires more acceleration or deceleration of the motors to execute. A pitch and a roll doesn't take as much change in RPM just because of the way the setup of the quad is. So, if you're flying at your near your limit and you're yawing around, you're actually taking away from the maximum RPM range that the flight controller has access to in order to execute the moves, which in turn slows down your overall performance of the quad. So it would make sense that if you were less of a yaw pilot and focused more on court like banking through turns, you might potentially be able to make it through a track more efficiently, faster, and save battery life by doing so. And on top of this idea, by limiting your maximum throttle, you will never ever hit the point where the, the flight controller doesn't have enough RPM to execute a maneuver. I am just pulling this out of nowhere. I have no idea how the flight code works. I have no idea if they've even taken this into account. Maybe, who, For all we know, the motors will never even reach 100% because the flight control automatically limits everything to 90%, so it, automatically, so it already has overhead left to execute the maneuvers. No clue. 
but it's interesting to think about. And these are just two things that I've learned from other pilots. And there are a lot of other strategies, three in particular that I know of, that are not widely shared. Uh, one other soft strategy is that people are warming up their batteries. Or uh, uh, Night Fury, I know, he charges his batteries super fast. He charges at like 15, 20 amps. And what that does is it actually warms up the pack during the charge so that it gets the the electrons flowing easier. The, a warmer, a warm pack will dish out more more current than a cold pack. A lot of you already know this. When you fly in a cold environment, you don't quite have the same power as when you're flying in a warmer environment. Uh, and additionally, when your battery warms up a little bit, you feel like you got a little bit more juice. Things just flow, the, the throttle just flows easier. So what he's doing is he's warming up the packs and getting the resistance down lower. If you check on your charger and it does resistance, you will you can probably see that your resistance kind of gets cut in half when the battery is warm. So he charges them real fast to get that resistance down low and get the pack flowing easier. Uh, that's another trick. There are a, a couple of, there's exactly three other tricks that I know that I've heard of. One that I came up with myself that uh, I know one team is using that are not, it's, they're not like cheating or anything. They're well within all guidelines, everything. They're using the same exact parts, the same exact components, things like limiting your throttle to 80%. Like who would think that limiting your throttle to 80% is cheating? Like <laughs> you're limiting your max performance. Things like that, that can potentially give the pilot an edge based on how they fly and what they do. I think that the strategy of executing these tracks and executing these races in a setting where the the strategy actually matters is very 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 interesting i think it's it's one of the most interesting things about racing you know usually we show up to a race or a track or a sunday race or whatever and the track is already set up and you have no idea what it is and just get out there and fly and do whatever and it's fine and for the most part whatever you're flying doesn't matter you can fly your acro quad you can fly a two inch quad it doesn't it doesn't make a difference because it's it's more about skill and execution of you're piloting through the track rather than the strategy of which quad you're using and which motor you're using. Yeah, there might be a, a instances here and there where there's long straight, and so you pick your faster quad and that you know busts through the long straight quicker. But for the most part, there is no one thing. There's no one quad that's you know all around universally good for all all tracks and all races. And usually, I feel it has more to do with skill than the quad setup. Not usually, most of the time. I would love to do more kind of discussion about this area. I don't know if people are particularly interested in this area. I think that if uh, there were more race series that are publicized and on TV, I think it would be much more interesting if they discussed the fine details of the quads, of the setups, the pilots, what they have done to train, what they do to train, because some of these pilots are putting in some serious hours and thought into their training. So it's, it's, it's becoming something really, really interesting to discuss because, I mean, anytime someone's putting this much effort into what they're doing, it's got to be something interesting coming out of it. Uh, that's it. Sorry for the excessively long video today about arguably not much. And um, don't forget to floss. Bye-bye.